Welcome to Openings Explained. My name is Dennis LaRue, filling in for Jonathan Schrantz, and we've got a very special opening that we're going to cover tonight. We're going to cover the Shigorin counterattack and the two knights defense with move four, knight g5 for white. We know this has been a pretty popular uh, topic of discussion at, at the club over the past, you know, for as long as we've been doing YouTube videos. Mike has focused on it and people have responded to what Mike has done. Uh, my aim today is just to do my best to present as a objective an account as possible for both sides' ideas, um, how we can reach and, you know, maintain equality, you know, ideally, you know, up until move 20, even after knight g5, playing d5, and uh, sacrificing two pawns with black, um, we're going to hopefully be somewhat satisfied with the evaluation that black can still maintain equality in these lines, and that while knight g5 may not necessarily be premature, it de doesn't it's not the, you know, the end-all bust that sometimes it gets portrayed to be. Okay, so that being said, everyone familiar with open games in here, more or less, e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, and when we play bishop c4, we group this in as what kind of games? The Italian games typically what, what this gets referred to. What are some popular ideas for black here that we see, guys? If any. What are the two most common things? Bishop C5. Bishop C5, asking for some sort of piano, or maybe just the you know Greco style, right? Playing knight C3, castling early. Um, that's a whole different lecture in itself. Bishop C5, I think that gets played more at the higher level. Uh, but both get seen, both bishop c5 and the move in discussion today, knight f6, get seen pretty often at our level. Um, knight f6, the defining move in the two knights defense. How do we play as white normally here? Yeah, yes. You play knight g5 without even thinking about it. Any other moves that you like to play here that you ever try or you just know knight g5 is winning? Because you, yeah, you, did you watch Mike Cummer's video? Ah, you don't need to. It's just that obvious. Knight g5. Yep. <laughs> Knight g5, attacking f7. I would be remiss if I didn't just point out. We're not going to focus on it too long, but knight g5 is not the only move. Um, d3 and knight c3 are both definitely playable here, but they go into different, different slower, quieter lines. And many people believe that knight g5 is the most critical response. Um, Black needs to prove that he can survive this early attack on f7. And I'm sure everybody in here knows how do we, what's pretty much the only way to respond to it is by playing d5. And ed. Um, but before, let's just think about why d5 only. Are there some other ideas? Yeah, there are. Um, there's a Gambit idea. You can play bishop c5, which we're not going to look at too long. Or you can try and play tricks and traps, which we know are for kids, right? You can bring the knight into e4, at which point we are justified in sacrificing on f7 and getting into a line. And instead, We get, into, we get into this stuff. So d5, and we all know, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, that we don't, what don't we play here? It has black, with black to move. Knight takes d5, right, because it gets into Mike's favorite position, right? Or it gets into this famous fried liver thing. And we play what? I left it blank so you guys can walk me through it. Knight, knight takes f7. So here it works. And then how do we justify the sacrifice? With queen f3. Check. And we're not going to go any deeper into that. Um, but we can say with confidence that white, white is better here, right? Okay. Instead, we move the, white, the knight away. We move the black knight on c6 to a5. At which point, 
we take take advantage. We decide to hold on to our bishop pair by playing bishop b5. Is that the only move in this position, or do you think we can play some other stuff here? Again, this is not the focus, but it's good to know that there are some different approaches that we can take. If we want to kind of go back on our idea of being super aggressive with moves like knight g5, there is a playable move here, and that move is d3. Um, and it's been tried a few times throughout, throughout chess history, and it can wind up a little something like this. Definitely a slower game, and we're conceding the positional advantage of the bishop pair. Um, but without getting into a lot of the tactical wild complications that we get into. Otherwise, do we have one other option here with black? What, el what else can we try here? If we don't want to play the knight a5 line, is there something else? What about b5? And if he accepts it, he can either go to f1, which is likely recommended. Leaving, leaving black with more problems to solve. <laughs> or he can take here and kind of play into his hands and allow for a somewhat more natural development scheme for black. So those are reasons why maybe you might not want to play d3 excuse me, why you might not want to play b5 here, and instead just stick to the main line and play knight a5 instead, which seems logical. Threatening to get that bishop. White solves that problem by inserting a check. And we see c6, which initiates a gambit of sorts, right? He's giving up pawns here. What kind of comp is he getting compensation for the pawns? Do you think? Depends on which way it goes, but sometimes I think we can say with fairness that black with proper play can hold on even though he's two pawns down. But say you don't want to get into the crazy the craziness that comes after c6, then you can maybe consider something like bishop d7, which is a little bit more natural, and the computer likes it a little less. But this is definitely the kind of thing that is more suitable to beginner play and, and lower level play. Um, because it's not as tactically charged as everything that we're going to look at tonight. And play like this can follow in such a fashion. Queen e2, you know, discouraging. Bishop takes b5 because it's going to be answered by queen takes b5 check, picking up the knight. Um, or at least all the pawns on c6. And you get into something like this. White arguably has a slight edge. But it's not the exciting position that we reach with DC. And for those of you playing in the Mayhem Tournament, this is going to be the starting position right here with white to move. And we're going to choose, hopefully, this modern trend. Which looks a little funny, right? Blocking in our d pawn, but with the idea of increasing our the mobility of our knight on g5. Um, who sometimes has posed problems by that, that pawn on the e-file. So bishop d3 is a move, and that's the main move we're going to look at. But before we go any further, you can just make everybody aware that there are some more <coughs> natural ways to play. Bishop e2, the knight will almost always get kicked. And you can play knight h3, which looks funny and was a subject of debate and still is. Or you can play just this natural looking knight f3. Um, both, are, both are okay and playable here. And this is a funny looking entertaining move in this position, right? 
pinning the rook on a8 and we were engine checking this earlier and as a matter of fact you know you can actually allow um, you can just take the bishop and allow queen takes a8 and still have still have a roughly equal game believe it or not Uh, meaning, like in this position, the engine was still saying equal. Uh, again, just a sideline, as far as tonight's lecture is concerned. Or you can play something crazy like that, which I, which you shouldn't do. Okay, bishop d3. Leaving what? Leaving black with a few different choices. You guys with black pieces, what are you? What, what would you like to play here? Is it? Knight d5 or knight g4, which makes more sense? Let's look at this guy first. So knight g4. Discovered attack on which piece? On the knight on g5, right? So we move our attacked piece. f5 is played. We have an only move. You must play bishop b2 there, threatening to recapture the knight if fe is played. Play just kind of proceeds like that, where he's going to continue to try and pressure f2, um, and he's threatening. Oh, he's put threatening to pressure f2 um, with a simple move like queen d4, and it's always fun to say that you're threatening the castle, right? I'm threatening to put my king in safety, but also bring another piece down to bear on that weak looking f2 pawn. So at this point white has to play a move that I wouldn't find um, but is allegedly a forcing line um, with the idea of discombobulating or disconnecting this battery which black is always trying to form right here on c5 and d4 uh, in that fashion. And you can get into a crazy position like this. Or instead of playing if instead of playing d4 after bishop c5 in this crazy line, you can play knight c3. And not, you're not looking for activity so much, but you're giving black the activity here, um, which is the opposite from what you're doing in the other line. Um, and his activity definitely comes in the form of that checkmate threat and just a relentless attack on f2. But these are the things that we're trying to avoid. This is why we don't play knight g4 here. But instead, the knight on f6 goes to d5. Now knight f4 is always in the position, which we're going to see grows super annoying in a lot of different lines. How would you guys react to this with white pieces here? Would anybody think to play h4? I know I wouldn't, but this is what all the pros are doing right now. Or a lot of them, at least. What's our big threat here with white? If black doesn't do anything, we're going to bring a third piece down to bear on f7, right? Which piece? Mm, how's the rook going to... No. But he may be, may be way later, but there's another piece that can attack f7 from two squares in one move. I mean, yeah, yeah, depend. There's, it can be attacked from f3 or h5 with which piece? Yeah. So this is always a threat in the position, which is why 
Black's almost his only move, arguably, right here is queen c7, keeping an eye on that f7 square. And if he doesn't play it, we're going to see that white will just invariably proceed with that plan. Say he tries to castle kingside, we're going to keep threatening f7 until everything crumbles. And these are the kinds of lines that make this opening appealing to me, um, especially with white and then with black. I'm also curious about, you know, how to hold it. Um, so that's one possibility after the natural developing move, bishop e7. But what about the more aggressive bishop c5? Still, we're going to attack f7 with queen f3. Black will respond in, in kind with f5, which is always a plan for him in this type of position. And we'll react with, with knight c3. And like that. Yeah, rough equality here. Um, so those are the reasons, yeah, or maybe even, yeah, slightly, slightly better. Um, Anyway, that's why queen c7 gets played here. Defending f7 ahead of time. At which point, you can retreat your knight and say, hey, I was just joking about move four. Or you can say, nope, I'm really serious. I'm going to follow through with my threats on the light squares. Um, and I'm going to take away the option of you playing h6 at any point, because now you don't have an h pawn. And if we don't do that, then we'll see that, just like in the last line, if we don't stop white from his plan, he'll just keep doing it. Same thing here. If we don't stop black from his plan of playing h6, he's going to keep cramping our style with it. Okay, there's that knight going to f4. The bishop retreats, seemingly hanging that c pawn, but what if we take that pawn? What happens? We break it open with d4. And that move should start to feel familiar, especially for a lot of you guys who have been seeing me cover some of the c4 stuff, right? Yeah. So d4, breaking it open. And giving white a good position. But we take on h7, to which the, the biggest challenge is presented by g6. And we have no good reason not to proceed with our plan. Again, pretty straightforward. We started attacking, f, started attacking f7 on move 4. Move 11, I see no good reason to switch it up. Black has to respond in kind, block, block said attack, at which point we can Make another developing move, but be faced with a little fork. Right. And this is where all the theory is, is honestly pretty difficult um, and justified by a lot of by, by uh, tactical lines. Um, so for instance, knight b4, what's our instinct? What do we, we see that c2 is is where, where we're going to get forked, what do we want to do? We want to move out of the way from the check, right? But unfortunately, that kind of hampers our, kind of cramps our style um, irreparably. We allow him to get just free play all over the queen side with those semi-open uh, B and D files. He, he's already got, now that night that was looking silly, uh, Going to have some activity. And we just don't want that. So instead, we take one of the attackers, or we attack one of the attackers of c2 with a crazy move like g4, inviting the fork, responding to it then, to which black is almost 
forced to continue attacking. And we get this cool queen g3 move, preventing the e-pawn from moving forward. And then this strange looking move. C2 is a weird square for him. Okay. And at this point, the claim is that if we play perfectly, we can get into something roughly drawish. And this is kind of a sample line. Um, in which we see both sides exchanging a lot of stuff and getting into a position where there is going to be a forced draw for black by perpetual. All right, and now I'm going to stop and ask you guys for some feedback, um, what do we think? Is that a bunch of craziness? Do we play like that? How far do we get in our own games? And so on. Anything, does any, has anybody gotten into this line? Ever, um, to this point? Does everybody feel somewhat comfortable playing with white pieces from this position? And I, yeah, what do you guys think is best here and why? Because yeah, we're playing the Mayhem tournament tonight. I'm going to set you up with this, with white to move. I like the queen f3 idea. It, it's a cool looking idea. So let's yeah, let's let's look at it a little bit more, right? We like. We all. It's kind of got. It always feels like you. There's a bit of psychological value in a move like that, right? Yeah, I would have been black. You would you would not be comfortable with which side in that in that variation. Okay, so that, yeah, let's let's look at that and see if we can approach something uh, like an objective eval of that position. All right, because it, it was just something that we looked at really briefly beforehand. Um, and, and Danny well, you kind of mentioned that, and then we engine checked it, and he was right. It's, you can just probably take the bishop and allow queen takes a eight. Uh, But on what principles? Just without calculating, why, why might that be okay? Um, I'm going to say that even though my knight a5 is on the, on the rim, he's still a, he's still a second developed piece um, compared to the knight g5, and I'm not really counting the queen a8 because she's in play, but she's not centralized, and so she, you know, a lot of her effect is just. Restricted to that that quadrant, the you know black's queen side, um, and then the other the other feature that that, that pops out to me uh, is that you have semi open files in your favor on the queen side for black. If you can, it's likely that you're going to be able to finish development first. You can probably get some good pressure going on those. Uh, D, so queen queen takes a eight. I played bishop d six, right? And you want to. And so here, we played bishop d6, so, and I decided that no, knight g4, right, that bit, knight g4 is, is stronger, because then I want to play bishop d6 and f5. Um, so here it's white to move, and we, this is all the stuff that we were just analyzing, yeah. So maybe, a7? You can't play that, it seems just, you know, again, without calculating, it feels a little off track, but uh, we are threatening mate, like you said. It's just he castles after, right? Doesn't he? No? Well, here you just trade knight. I mean, the queen takes knight on g5. And that's what it looks like to me, but he does need to avoid the... I mean, that's after he avoids, yeah, the f2 problem. And it's not mate, it's yeah, check, and then he goes to d1, and he's unhappy forever. Um, and there's probably mate soon to follow. Uh, okay, so in this line, yeah, exchange knights is what he's saying, right? Taken here. Yep. And yeah, this is what you're talking about. He takes a5. Yeah, see here, I think since black has more activity, he'll listen 
He has more activity. That queenside majority for white does not, it looks, you know. Uh, so I know I'm, I'm saying queenside majority that, yeah, this, this four versus one here is, is promising for white um, to un understate. Yeah, I mean, maybe either, yeah, bishop d7 doesn't really, I mean, bishop d7, queen a8, queen d8, maybe something like that. Um, this is losing for black, without a doubt, yep. And the engine, the engine says, says as much. Um, so let's backtrack our analysis just a bit. And luckily, yeah, we're at equality here with queen takes a7, so the way to proceed should be this, not, not, my, not my bishop d6 plan. Um, but knight g4 was okay. Knight g4 was okay. Uh, and here we get into something like this. <laughs> well, yeah, that now, well, now it's, yeah, we're still uh, closer to equality than we were. Um, this is equality. So bishop e7, and it's going to be, here it's going to be tough, I would argue, for white to get any kind of serious edge. Yeah. 5, queen a8. Wow, I'm playing perfect moves like a computer. Look at this. All right, hg. And there's that trade. And yeah, roughly equal. Uh, we need to play a funny move, apparently. B4 to stop that. He castles. So B4. And we'll stop our analysis there. But yeah. Rough equality, maybe a small, small edge to black, maybe, yeah. depending on what depth it goes to. So that's that. Well, you guys are interested in the queen f3 line. Okay. So for those of you at home, if you lost track, we're looking at the line, not our main line, which was bishop d3, but this very playable. Exciting look, looking idea, queen f3, leaving our bishop hanging. The idea being that the pawn on c6 is pinned to the rook. And we just spent the past 10 minutes asking whether or not that's really such a big deal. And I think we can say that it isn't. With proper play, which is arguably kind of hard to find, um, but maybe not so hard. Those are pretty, pretty natural looking moves, knight g4, bishop e7, and and d7 um, all give us the activity all along with you know the bishop compensate for uh, losing the heavy on a8 yeah let's take a look at it uh, you said b7 right b or d um, Right, yeah, because the knight holds it. Let's let's start with b7 and then then take a look here. I'm probably just going to retreat the bishop, right? Uh, bishop a4, b3, and I wonder. Let's yeah, let's let's look at it a little bit and then ask ourselves. Well, and then ask the, the engine rather what he thinks. Knight a4. I mean, bishop, bishop a4, um, um, yeah, so is bishop e7 there, my mistake. Yeah, white to move, yeah, and I'm, I'm, what do we think is strongest here, guys? Knight c3, d4, the knight c3 or castles, and just, yeah, avoid the hassle, like Jonathan says. Huh? Yeah, yeah, let's quote, yeah, Jonathan Schrantz, avoid the hassle, let's just castle, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. And he does the same and lets it. Yeah, but you can be five out of the three. Uh, it's active enough, it's developing a piece and it's clamping down on this this E four square which are which the knight is attacking and the bishop eventually will be. Um, yeah. 
Queen d4, maybe if black? Without the bishop on c5, I don't know. C3, hold on. Yeah. And then he loses it. Hold on. Queen d5, or queen d4, bishop. Bishop b3, or maybe is knight c3 too crazy there? Queen d4. Bishop b3 is a natural move. Can I play something like this too? Yeah, you also have b3 coming up. Yeah. And now, yeah, bishop e3 is in the cards, right? Yeah. But this is why we do it. This is why we uh, get a feel for these positions before we're, you know, playing them with with something at stake. Okay. So, but let's go right here where Claudio and I were. Where did we stop, Claudio? Right here, right? Basically. Yeah, it liked your, it liked the d3 move, and then. It wants to play c5, which I didn't, I didn't get in there. Yeah, yeah, to activate the bishop and and liquidate the island. Yeah, I see three ninety four. So maybe play looks a little something like this, right? Um, yeah, yeah, that's natural enough, right? And you're gonna, yeah, more or less. Hang on to equality. So short answer, yeah, bishop e7 is, is totally a move there, as probably bishop d7 is um, right here. So yeah, you can be, you know, reckless and, and try and prove that you're okay with, 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 uh, without the rook, or you can just be sensible, like, like the highest, play, highest rated player in the room, and play a move like bishop b7 or bishop d7. I agree. Okay, so we're coming close to the end. What do you guys think about the two knights? Never play this, ever? <laughs> Is knight g5 really scary with black still? Because part of my motivation here was to, you know, take away some of my fear, because um, I'm trying to break free of playing c5 and as an answer to e4 all the time. And one reason that I don't is because I'm just totally unfamiliar with all the theory. Um, in the open game, c4, e5 stuff. Uh, and, you know, players way stronger than me all, you know, laugh at the idea that knight g5 is like, you know, is proving that, you know, black's position is bust or something here. It's far from it. It's very complicated. So if, if anything, hopefully we, we develop some appreciation of that, of uh, a lot of the complex tactical possibilities here. Okay. So just a quick review. Um, you guys playing in the mayhem tonight. We're going to be starting here. And we spent a little bit of time on, on White's options. They were bishop d3, which was our main line. Um, we spent the last 15 minutes or so looking at different things that can happen after this cool move. Um, and then there is also... Well, it branches twice after the bishop e2 line. Um, you have to decide where you want to put your knight after h6 comes, and there you will find tons and tons of discussions about this online. Um, oh, this is, yeah, uh, Steinitz would, felt very strongly, strongly about that, and there were, you know, players up until, you know, up, up into the mid part of the 20th century still talking about this. Uh, I mean, this whole line has been a, a topic of discussion in chess chess theory for you know as long as there's been chess chess theory someone I think it was like Tarash called this a, a bungler's move for knight g5 is a bungler's move um, because we're breaking a principle of doing what in the opening we're moving a piece twice uh, and the jury's still out whether or not it's justified but I know I'm still going to play it like these guys they didn't even think twice d3 d4 those aren't moves in this position right there's only one move here for white, right? Knight g5. But it gets a little complicated. Did, would you want to face some of these lines that we saw black as? I mean, they're not, none of them are too scary, but it gets tricky, right? Yeah? Okay, well, hopefully you guys enjoyed that. Hit like, share, subscribe. See you guys next week. Thank you.